After the fall of Rome, who were the barbarian successor kingdoms? After the Western Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century, multiple small states formed in the ruins. How successful were the so-called barbarian kingdoms, and how Roman was they? In the 4th and 5th centuries CE, the Roman Empire was flooded with Germanic warriors who split the Western Empire into a series of successor kingdoms. While this period is sometimes known as the Dark Ages, the pattern of cultural change was complex and region-specific. Most of those who took part in the so-called barbarian invasions admired the Roman Empire and sought to emulate the Roman way of life. From the Vandal Renaissance in North Africa to the law codes of Visigoth Spain, many aspects of old Roman life were retained for some time in these new kingdoms. Other regions changed more rapidly, losing their vibrant urban culture for many centuries and all the western kingdoms were negatively impacted by long-lasting political instability. After the fall of Rome, a few of these new states achieved great longevity, while others would have a very brief heyday, before collapsing into dust. Here is a brief introduction to the five major barbarian successor states. The Germanic Vandals who participated in the fall of Rome, settled in the Roman provinces in Africa, creating a short-lived but prosperous kingdom there. The Vandals had once been on positive terms with Rome, after a peace agreement made during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, and some of them had been granted lands in the Roman province of Pannonia, under Constantine I. During the barbarian invasions of the 5th century, however, the Vandals became Rome's enemies, crossing the Rhine border in 406 to loot the empire, along with many other opportunistic tribes. Finding the provinces of Gaul and Hispania by now quite crowded with other roving warbands, the Vandals took the chance to cross from Spain to North Africa in 429. When in Africa, they slowly spread across the continent, absorbing most of the Roman provinces there. While the Western Roman government tried to broker a deal to make them subjects of the empire, the Vandals soon established themselves as an independent power. The Vandals attempted to maintain a close relationship with late Roman Italy anyway, but they would end up sacking Rome itself in 455 when this arrangement was threatened by a change of emperors. Italy relied heavily on grain from Africa to feed its citizens, and the late Roman government would attempt to reclaim the region but failed miserably. The Vandals' long history of contact with the Romans would have a profound influence on their way of life, and despite their far-flung origins, the Vandals took to their new lifestyle on the African coast with gusto. After capturing some of the most important seaports in the Mediterranean, including Carthage, the brand new Vandal navy became a force to be reckoned with, seemingly overnight. So much so that the old English word for the Mediterranean is the Wendell Sea. The Vandals' new maritime venture made them quite wealthy, providing them with the luxurious Roman lifestyle they so desired. While undoubtedly most of this wealth came from the raw materials and the trade in luxuries that Roman North Africa had once been famous for, the Vandals also gained a bit of a reputation for piracy. Bolstered by their newfound wealth, Vandal Africa emerged as one of the most successful, and one of the most Roman of the barbarian successor states. In stark contrast to the rest of the crumbling Roman Empire, the population of North Africa went up, not down. In a time when towns were being abandoned in the West, archaeological studies of North Africa revealed that many Roman public buildings, such as baths, and palaces were expanded and repaired, and private dwellings such as Roman townhouses were built and rebuilt, in an effort to keep up the lavish Roman lifestyle. Vandal North Africa was in fact so culturally Romanized that we know very little about the Vandals themselves. The new rulers kept most aspects of Roman provincial government, including the Roman taxation system, and they continued to employ local African staff. Intellectual life also continued in Africa to some extent. The Vandal aristocracy sponsored Latin poets just as the Romans had done, during a period that is sometimes known as the Vandal Renaissance. These poets such as Luxurious, give us a glimpse of the highly Romanized culture of the Vandal kingdom in their verses. In spite of their many successes, the Vandals gained a poor reputation, partly because they adopted heretical Arian Christianity, and persecuted Catholic Christians with great vigor. Using religion as a pretext for invasion, the Byzantines would soon descend on North Africa, 
reconquering the region in 534. The Ostrogoths were one of the Germanic tribes who settled in the Balkans during the barbarian invasions of the 4th and 5th centuries CE. Before long they had united under King Theodoric, who took his armies to Italy in 490, conquering the vulnerable and by now a war-torn peninsula. The last Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus had recently been deposed by another Romano-barbarian general, King Odoacer. After the fall of Rome, the exasperated Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno asked Theodoric to reconquer Italy, in a bid to get the Ostrogoths to leave his own lands and rid himself of the troublesome Italian king at the same time. When Theodoric took the throne in 493, the machinery of the Roman government continued to function much as it always had. The Ostrogoths kept the Senate as a feature of the Italian government, and they focused on building great churches and other monumental structures across the kingdom. King Theodoric was, in theory, supposed to be an agent of the Eastern Roman Emperor, and he styled himself as a Roman leader. We are told that Theodoric was named the New Trajan and the New Valentinian by his supporters, although in reality, he had little in common with the emperors of old. Theodoric's relationship with the Roman aristocracy was ultimately uneasy. As tensions with the Eastern Romans began to escalate, a paranoid Theodoric purged some prominent Roman aristocrats for alleged treasonous actions. Among those arrested was the once powerful senator and erudite philosopher, Boethius, who is sometimes referred to as the last Roman, because he wrote one of the last great pieces of Roman literature, the deeply moving consolation of philosophy, while he was awaiting execution. While Theodoric kept his kingdom politically stable for a time, Italy's prosperity in this period took an enormous nosedive. No longer collecting revenue and goods from the rest of the empire, Italy now had to sustain itself alone, leaving everybody much poorer as a result. The loss of goods from Africa was a particularly harsh blow, and we know from our sources that Italy experienced food shortages. While the city of Rome had once supported a population of over one million people in the second century, it now sustained something in the region of only 20 to 40,000. In spite of this huge drop in population, Italy did retain much of its urban culture after the fall of Rome, unlike other parts of the Western Empire where many people fled to the countryside. Archaeology from the Ostrogothic and later Lombard period show that large Roman townhouses were still occupied, although they were increasingly broken up into multiple smaller dwellings, as the local population became more impoverished. Ravenna in particular was the capital of Ostrogothic Italy, and it received a cosmetic makeover. Several beautiful Ostrogothic monuments, including the Basilica of Sant Apollinare Nuovo, are still standing today. The Ostrogoths' hold on Italy and its hinterland were ultimately very short-lived. Italian cities like Rome and Ravenna were still attractive prizes to many people, and before long the East Roman Byzantines had challenged Ostrogothic rule, plunging the peninsula into a disastrous state of perpetual warfare once again, in the 6th century. The Frankish kingdom is one of the most successful barbarian states on our list, and we know a lot about the Franks because they became a major power after the fall of Rome. In the 5th century, the Roman province of Gaul was initially fractured into multiple kingdoms, split between the Burgundians, the Franks, the Alamanni, and the Visigoths, among others. The Franks were one of the many Germanic tribes who fought to control Gaul, occupying the north, and eventually swallowing the rest of what is now France. They also ruled over the Benelux region, as well as large stretches of Germany, most of which fell outside of the Roman provinces. While the Franks themselves were initially split into several groups, they were soon united under King Clovis I, who has historically been awarded the impressive title of the first king of France. Clovis would begin the process of removing the Visigoths in the south, and he would inaugurate a stable and powerful kingdom, under the Frankish Merovingian dynasty. Clovis also gave the Franks stability in another way, by immediately converting to Catholicism. He was the first barbarian king to do so, as most of the barbarian powers in this period were Christian Arians. Clovis' pragmatic decision would prevent some of the problems that many other post-Roman states had, due to the religious conflict. While Frankish culture would soon grow to be quite prosperous, initially the region was devastated by an endless string of barbarian invasions. 
Nevertheless, elites in the early medieval Gaul, soon to be known as Francia, came out on top during this troubled period of European history, retaining for themselves a high level of wealth and power. Their successors, the Carolingian dynasty would later become the foremost power in Western Europe.